Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to our new study. That is 1 Timothy. We're going to begin the pastoral epistles. If you're not familiar with what that is, there are three individual letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. There are personal letters that Paul wrote to two young men who were pastors, and he had mentored them both. As we'll see, he, he calls both of them sons in the faith, and he's encouraging them and admonishing them how to fulfill their ministry, their call, and what church is supposed to look like when we gather together. So if you're jotting down notes, we're going to follow up. An outline, if you will. We're going to look into a lot of details as we study, but it's important, I think, and beneficial to back up and get the big picture. So in chapter one, Paul is going to discuss the message of the church. In chapters two and three, Paul is going to discuss the members of the church. In chapter four, he's going to talk about the minister of the church. And then in chapters 5 and 6, he's going to talk about the ministry of the church. In chapter 5, he's going to focus on the ministry to itself. In chapter 6, the ministry to the world. How many of you have ever been to a pastor's conference? A few of you. Well, over the next weeks, months, however long it takes us, years, decades, whatever the Lord leads, you're going to be able to raise your hand if you're ever asked that before because, because Paul is basically writing a letter to a young pastor to tell him what that looks like and what his focus should be and how he's supposed to do that. And so we're probably not going to get very far this morning, but in the first few verses We're going to look at the men involved, Paul writing the letter, Timothy, the recipient of it. We'll get a little bit into the ministry, although we'll dive deeper into that as we continue our study. And then in the end, I I want to pay close attention to the mercy. The men, the ministry, and the mercy that Paul is going to discuss. So, let's dive into chapter 1. Verse 1, first word, Paul. Paul. Unlike the way that we write letters, we we, we write to whom it may concern, we say what we're going to say, and then we write something like sincerely, Gordon. That's not the way they wrote letters back then. So Paul is identifying himself up front. He calls himself Paul, the first thing that he says. And I believe that we could spend the rest of our time discussing just that. If if we wanted to, we won't, but if we wanted to. Because the fact that he calls himself Paul signifies a change in this man's life. A drastic change in this man's life. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, Luke records... Paul's conversion. And after his conversion, he he met Jesus on the Damascus road. On his way to Damascus, he had letters from the religious leaders to persecute anyone who called on the name of Jesus. All who followed what was called the way. It still is, by the way, the way, because Jesus is the way. I would encourage you, this is a complete side note, get back to biblical language as much as you can. But he has this conversion, and for nine years after his conversion, he goes by his original name, which is Saul. He's known as Saul of Tarsus. His past, he was a very educated, highly respected Very zealous Pharisee. No doubt his parents named him after Israel's first king, Saul. He tells us in another epistle that he's of the tribe of Benjamin. 
And so he goes by this name, Saul, until his first missionary journey. That's recorded in Acts chapter 13. And it would appear, Luke records, that his first convert on his first missionary journey was a Roman proconsul named Sergius Paulus. And from that point forward, he is called by the name of Paul. Saul means requested one. Right? Because the children of Israel requested a king. They said, we want to be like everyone else. And so the Lord says, okay, I'll give you what you wanted. So the requested one was Saul. And so here's this highly educated, highly respected, very zealous Pharisee in his past known as Saul. And now Jesus is using him on his first missionary journey and a soul is converted to Christ his Lord. And I believe at that moment, he realized just how small he was. Consequently, that is what Paul means. Paul means little or small in the Latin. We get our English word from it. It's derived from it, the English word pauper. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, I am the least of all the saints. When's the last time you thought about Paul that way? When's the last time you thought about Paul and you thought, man, that guy, he was the lowest of the low. He was the smallest of all the believers. I highly doubt that anyone presently thinks that. Many challenged him in his day, in his apostleship, but, but not today. Everybody admires him and, and holds him in high regard. But he says, I am very, very little. I am very, very small. You see, you're, you're sitting in a pastor's conference. <laughs> And this is invaluable information right here, this very first word of this very first chapter. As I said, it speaks of a changed life. And when it comes to men in ministry, there must be a change. I mentioned last week that today's church is looking for methods. God is looking for men. The church is, is busy looking for methods. God is looking for men, but, but not just men. He's not just saying, well, if you're, if you're a man, well, come on. No. You see, because Jesus knows that if he doesn't change the man, the man will try to change the ministry. If he doesn't change the man, the man will try to change the ministry. And far too men have tried. They get sucked into the method mentality. When I was a young believer, I heard a quote and it radically changed my life. And even more so when I realized what it meant. At first it just sounded really, really cool. By an author named A.W. Tozer. And this is the quote. Before God can use a man greatly, he must wound that man deeply. How many of you are looking into going into ministry? <laughs> Before God can use a man greatly, he must wound that man deeply. And I thought, wow, that sounds so cool. People don't talk like that anymore. You go, A.W., until the wounding began. Now, looking back on that wounding, and who's to say that it's over, right? There's probably more wounding to come. But, but looking back over, over the wounding that I've already experienced, I do so with great gratitude. Because like Paul, I'm a changed man. And I didn't do the changing. Christ did the changing. I read another quote this week that just, wow. 
It was a question, really, and here's the question. Can a prideful man truly preach of the one who made himself of no reputation? Can a prideful man really preach the one who made himself of no reputation? He sits down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write this letter. And just with one word, we see a drastic life changed. Paul. Oh. So we first see the change, and then he moves on to his calling, his commission. He says, Paul, an apostle. That's what we know him by, right? That, we love that kind of stuff in the church. We, we're really not excited about the little stuff, about the small stuff. We're not, we're not so much interested in humility, right? We, we like titles, and, and we like positions, and we like power, and, and that kind of thing. He got there. But the change has to take place, right? Before God can use a man greatly, he must wound that man deeply. And, and so this man who, after his conversion, was mistreated by his old peers and mistrusted by his new ones, this guy didn't fit in where he'd come from and they wouldn't let him in on the reindeer games where he was going because nobody trusted him. This is the guy that persecuted everyone. And if it was Barnabas that finally convinced a few of them to, hey, give him a, give him a chance. He says, I'm an apostle. There's a lot of men today who call themselves apostles. And the word apostle, if, if you want to split hairs and maybe argue, you could possibly argue that apostle is used in, in, in two different ways in the New Testament. But Paul is referring to the original, the most pure sense of the word. And there were only a few of them. There were the twelve, Matthias, Barnabas, James the Lord's brother, and Paul. Just a few of them who were commissioned to help establish the foundation of the church and their ministries were authenticated by miracles and all of them had seen the resurrected Christ. In the secular, this, this Greek word used in the secular has this idea of an ambassadorship, a, a diplomatic a agent, if you will. And when Paul was called, and he recounted that all throughout the book of Acts, Jesus says, I've called him to bear my name among the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Saul, the requested one, is now Paul the little, because he recognizes finally it's not about him. It's about him. His name doesn't matter anymore. There's only one name that matters. And his calling is to represent, to bear that name, the name Jesus. He's an apostle. And notice what he says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not Peter. Not the latest pope. Not one of the other apostles. Not of the church membership, not of a deacon board, not of a, an elected committee. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who sits at the Father's right hand, the high and lofty one. I'm an apostle of him. But he doesn't just talk about his change. He doesn't just talk about his call and commission. Look what he says. In, in multiple of Paul's letters, if you're familiar with his, his epistles, he says, Paul, an apostle by the will of God. Paul, an apostle by the will of God. Paul, an apostle by the will of God. He does something different here because he's writing to a young pastor. He's trying to encourage this young man that he's mentoring. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment 
of God. Now, to you and me, we'll read over that and think, well, let's get through the introduction real quick and let's get to the meat and potatoes. But if you were young Timothy, these words would be invaluable to you. We'll talk about him in a moment. Timothy needs to be reminded that the calling that is on his life is not just a calling, it is a command. In the Greek, this is a military term, which means to fall in under rank. In the verb usage in the New Testament, it's used to describe Jesus commanding evil spirits to come out of people. It's also used describing Jesus commanding the wind to cease. To kind of give you an idea of the forcefulness of this. Paul says, this is not something that I just think maybe I'll do every now and then. This is a command upon my life. In one place in Corinthians, Paul said this. He says, I don't boast about what I do because necessity has been laid upon me. He says, he says don't think anything great of me because I preach the gospel. He says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is me. He's like, guys, don't look at me and think, oh, well, look at him. He's living such a sacrificial life, ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, I can't help but to do this. And in another place, he says this. He says it this way. The love of Christ constrains me. I have to do this. I, I shared it before. It's probably a good reminder. My first pastor at the church that I got saved at, I I was around 19 years old, and I began to feel God calling me into the ministry, but I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what that future was. I, I had no idea that I was going to be a pastor at that point, but I just, I felt called into the ministry, and, and, and I went to him to get some direction about going into seminary and that type of thing. And, and I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm waiting for him to give me some great, great advice. And he did. He did, but, but at the moment... <laughs> At the moment, I wanted to snatch him across the desk and slap him in the face because I'm excited and I'm sitting there across from him and I'm sharing with him all that's on my heart. And then there was a little bit of a silence. He looked me in the eyes and he said this, do not preach until you have to. I thought, what kind of advice is that? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. You got a young man sitting across from you. He is just ready to go and do it. And all you got to do is say, sick him to the bulldog. And you tell him, stop. Best advice he could have ever given me. Paul says, woe is me. Woe is me. There's a saying, it's an old saying in the church. You may have heard it, maybe not. It says, some are called, some are sent, and some just went. There have been so many days that all I had was the call. There were times when everybody looked at me and many of my mentors and said, who you? Who, like, like they did Jesus, who gave you the authority to do this? I can't, I, you've heard me share different times. I've had multiple people that were over me say, well, I ain't sending you. I'm like, okay. And? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment, of God. Now I know church members in our modern church age get uncomfortable with this type of language, but Paul needs this young man to understand that your calling and commandment are not from men. Because if you allow men to cause you to compromise, you're going to be in trouble. And more importantly, the sheep are going to be in trouble. 
Because from the, the, the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, the enemy was persecuting, persecuting, persecuting. There was all of this stuff from without, without, without. And they were, they were just shaking it off, thinking themselves worthy to, to suffer for Jesus, unworthy to suffer for his name. And so the enemy changed tactics and he starts working from within. And you have Ananias and Sapphira, and then there was division. The Grecian widows and the, the Hebrew widows were arguing. She got two more pieces of chicken than I did. You know, it took their walker and her cane, and it was fighting out there in the foyer. And so the elder committee got together and they voted and said, well, we need to go to the pastors and we need to tell them they need to do something about this. And they were shocked with the response because the apostle says, we ain't doing nothing about that. I wonder how many people left the church. I've had a lot of people leave the church that come to me and say, uh, Pastor Gordon, we, we, we need an XYZ at the porch. And I say, sounds great. When do you start? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not. I'm, I'm telling you, you need to. Oh, you ain't telling me what I need to do. I don't take my orders from you. Right. Well, Gordon, that sounds, I can't help what it sounds like. This is Bible. This is chapter and verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God. Here's what their response was. You pick you out seven men full of the Holy Ghost to deal with this. They weren't belittling the situation. They had a love for the church. They cared about those widows. It wasn't that. They said, we have a calling. We have a commandment. They said, we will give ourselves. We will give ourselves to the word of God in prayer. And do you know what Luke tells us right after that? That many people were saved. The church multiplied. Signs and wonders kept going. The church functions properly when leadership operates properly. It does. So Paul says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God. And then he says two things. Our Savior. I love the fact that he says our right? Paul's talking about himself. He's, he's introducing himself and he says, Timothy, I'm this. Now, that's, a, that's another good little note to take. Timothy knew who Paul was and he knew Paul was an apostle. He didn't, he didn't need Paul to tell or remind him that he was an apostle. So this is how we know that just because this is a personal letter, Paul intended it to be read to the church that Timothy was pastoring, which is, by the way, Ephesus. We'll find that as we continue studying. Paul is in Macedonia as he writes this letter and he's encouraging Timothy that's been left at Ephesus. Wow, this was probably one of the largest churches in that time in that area. And if you remember from the book of Acts, that that's where they worship the goddess Diana. That's where Paul says that there were... There were beasts that fought against him, right? Wild beasts. So it was, it was a tough job. It was a tough job for this young man. And so Paul tells him that God is our. He's also reminding him of his calling, right? Our. God, our Savior. And the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our, there it is again, hope. He doesn't say God, my Savior, and Jesus Christ, my hope. Although that would have been true, but he's including, he's reminding Timothy about this. But notice something, this is theological, off, not really off to the side, but not the flow of where we're heading. But notice that he uses the word and, he's going to do that quite often. And he puts God the Father and Jesus Christ on an equal plane. Right, Zach mentioned that, that they taught on, on the deity right, of Christ in that first study. It's important for us to recognize who Jesus really is. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But notice what he says too, last in this verse, our hope, our hope. Many, many pastors hope they don't get fired. Oh, it's true. You chuckle. But in a lot of denominations, these, these young men and sometimes old men 
they don't know whether or not they're going to get voted in again. Right? So they're, they're on the job and they're trying to do the best they can and they're hoping they maintain a job. And then those same people will point their crooked little finger and their, their little poochy little nose and say, you acting like a hireling. Who making him one? You. We don't have that problem here at the church, but, but a lot of them hope their sermon is received. A lot of them hope that they are liked by the congregation. A lot of them hope, and I could go on and on, just down the list at what so many pastors are hoping in the natural. And no doubt Timothy, being human, myself, I've hoped a lot of stuff as a pastor. But Paul is trying to tell Timothy, tell me, and to tell every other man who bears the title pastor, your hope is not found in the congregation. Your hope is not found in a signature at the bottom of your paycheck. Your hope is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And a pastor needs to understand that. Needs to understand it. Because as we're going to see in a moment, Timothy's got issues. Preachers don't have issues. I know what some people think, but... Those aren't wings, they're shoulder blades. I'm human. I'm human. I face temptations and trials and struggles. I get tired. I get discouraged. I get jealous. I get my feelings hurt. I, I go through everything that you go through. Gordon, don't tell us that. This is depressing. It's the truth. It's the truth. Took me a long time to realize I am Gordon and I am a pastor. Notice the first line, Paul. That's who I am. Do you know that there's a lot of people who sit in churches who don't realize that the pastor is a man? He's a man like everybody else. And most of them are never treated that way. They're just not. And they wonder why there's awkwardness between, between the pastor and the people and why that's, that's part of it. I can't tell you how many times I've been walking through the church doing something with an event here and somebody goes, oh, no, 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 let me get that for you. You don't need to be doing that. And I'm thinking, why? Well, you're the pastor. That's all the more reason why I ought to be doing it. But people have some really weird ideas about this whole thing. I was having a conversation with one of my daughter-in-laws, was it yesterday? It was yesterday, it was the day before. I had one of those two days. She was sharing about someone that she had heard of who was, was married to a pastor and things happen and she's kind of walking away from the church and all the rest. And in that conversation, you know, we don't know all the details, right? But we were just, just kind of thinking how sad that is and it just breaks your heart when you hear that kind of thing and and I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a full-time job. And I have fought my entire ministry life to keep my wife and my children out of the silly garbage that church people think we're supposed to be. See, I was called to be a pastor, not my wife. She wasn't. Now, she's part of the equation, right? God knew that. By the way, yesterday was my birthday. And when I was born, I, I say that to say this, not because I want anybody to say, oh, I didn't tell him happy birthday. The day that I was born, nine months later to the day my wife was born. What a coinky dink. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe it was just like Adam. It ain't good for that man to be alone. <laughs> 
So the day that I was being born, God was answering a future prayer that I had never prayed. Anyway, anyway, she wasn't called into the ministry. I was to be a pastor. Nor were my sons, you know, PKs. They weren't, but oh, everybody knows what a PK is. I don't have PKs. Cindy and I didn't have PKs. We had children, thank you very much. As a man and a woman, we had children. And God has a calling on their life, just like he has on my life and on her life. Now, some of you are like, I get that. I, I, I've seen that. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? Let's get back to the message. This is the message. This is the message. He says, Timothy, you are going to need your hope planted in the right place. Like the psalmist in Psalm 42 and 43, why art thou downcast, O my soul? Hope thou in God. That's where your hope should be. So I'm not here this morning hoping that the service goes well. As a matter of fact, during worship, I was sitting there. Everybody was worshiping. It was just a wonderful moment. And I thought, Lord, you are so good. You're doing this. You're doing this. I'm like, wow. So in verse 1, he's reminding Timothy, you're a changed man because of Christ. You have a call on your life. A call on your life. And it's a commandment. You must do what Christ has commissioned you to do. And he ends with this confidence. He says, Christ is your hope. When you walk into that church in Ephesus, you walk in with the absolute confidence of Christ not confidence in the flesh, not confidence in your ability, not confidence in who you are, confidence in Christ. Verse 2. Unto Timothy. This name Timothy means honoring God. And this young man did that very thing. There's some interesting things about Timothy. Timothy. We'll, we'll touch on a few with a little bit of time that we have left. The first thing that comes to mind is his, his home life. Timothy was biracial. His mother was Jewish, and his father was Greek. So some would think, well, right off the bat, that's kind of against him. You could argue that. You really could, and I'm sure... There were struggles in his life as a result. Because do you fit in with the Jewish culture? Or do you fit in with the Greco-Roman culture? Are you one of them or are you one of them? So he's, he's got this biracial background. And the scripture tells us that his father, being a Greek, was not a believer. So he had no spiritual fatherhood over him. For years, I allowed the enemy to tell me that that was holding me back. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, man, I can relate to Timothy. I didn't have a spiritual father in my life. The enemy would love, if that's the case with you, to say to you, you poor little baby. That's going to hinder you from now on. And if you believe that lie, it will. Because I watched my father take his father issues to the grave. And it devastated his life. But here's Timothy, this young man who doesn't have a spiritual father in his house. He comes from this biracial background, which was by divine design in God's economy. Because Paul, the apostle, who was this devout Jewish man, who was also a Roman citizen, was going to be called to go to all the places that he was going to go to. It would have been very nice to have a young man who had one foot in Jewish culture and one foot in Greco-Roman culture to be able to as 
our missionary team discussed, be able to connect and have a relational connection with all those people. So don't sit by like the world does. And many in the church say, poor little Timothy. He just had such a tough start. Do you think God is worried about tough starts? Remember what Philip said about Jesus? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Oh, you just wait and see. God specializes in going to the worst of places and bringing out the best of things. You ever heard of honey from the rock? So he didn't have a spiritual father in his life. But a man named Paul mentors him, becomes a father figure to him. And so he doesn't miss out on anything in his life. He had a mother named Eunice and a grandmother named Lois. How many, how many, how many mothers and grandmothers we have in the house? Yeah. Be encouraged. Because this father in this house, this, this Greek father who was not teaching the scriptures, was not in, in, impacting Timothy whatsoever spiritually. Hmm. Now, I don't want to belittle this. I'm a father, and, I, and you've heard me teach. I'm all about fatherhood and the importance of it. But just as God reminded you, maybe some of you need to be reminded this morning because I was in my little pity party because I didn't have what Timothy didn't have and God shook me one day and said, did Adam have one? Um, no. Paul reminds Timothy in these letters that his mother and grandmother instilled the scripture into his life. So I want to encourage you mothers and grandmothers, when you talk to your children, your grandchildren, don't be weird about it, but pray that the Holy Spirit would allow you to speak of Christ as often as you can. Just immerse them in the scripture and in the truth. And don't think for a minute it's not making an impact. Because on Paul's first missionary journey, this young man with a, with a Greek father and a Jewish mother becomes a convert. And that's why Paul calls him my own son in the faith. My son in the faith, he becomes born again and becomes this amazing minister for Christ. As, as we see in the scripture, he helps Paul establish so many churches. He's involved in so many aspects of Paul's missionary journeys. So much so, as, as, as I say, the church of Ephesus, he's now the pastor of that. And Paul entrusts this young man to that. So don't let your home life and your heritage hold you back in ministry. Even if your story is a little bit different from Timothy's, it doesn't matter. Don't you think Christ knows that when he calls you? Don't you think when Jesus saved me at age 15, he knew all the daddy stuff and the broken home stuff and the drug stuff? and He knew all of that. And none of that held him back. And it won't hold him back in your life either. Timothy had some health issues. Paul actually says he had often infirmities. It's the whole, you know, that's, that's the infamous verse where you don't just drink water, have a little wine for your often infirmities and your stomach's sake. And that's, you know, that's all the drinkers in the church want to use that verse, easy, easy, you know, whatever. That's, we'll talk about that later, but, but, but be that as it may, we know from the scripture that Timothy had apparently some kind of stomach issues, maybe nervous stomach, which would tend to make sense because he was very timid. He was a very timid young man, had insecurities, which would make sense, not having the father figure that he's supposed to have in his life and, and trying to work through all of that stuff. Whole different conversation. But many people would say, well, my health condition holds me back. By God's grace, and only by God's grace, I have stood on this stage 
sick before. Like, like sick, sick before. His grace is sufficient. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't even know what that was. He begged Jesus to take it out of his life. Could you imagine being Paul the Apostle? Healing ministry. And people looking at you sick and going, what's wrong? You don't have faith? Could you imagine? I mean, think about it. And yet, that's, that's what he dealt with. And Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. Sometimes God's he, God heals miraculously. And I've been a recipient of, a re recipient of that. I've been to the doctor, and the doctor said, there's nothing I can do for you, for, and then Christ heal me. And then there are some things that I deal with on a daily basis. Diet changes, just like Timothy. Managing stress, just like Timothy. Trying to do certain things, taking vitamins, walking and exercising. And sometimes God uses natural ways and medical ways. And sometimes, rut row, sometimes he doesn't do anything. Wow, can our faith manual handle that? Well, I tell you, it can if you understand your call and the command. When you understand who's in charge, then you start realizing that the potter can't, the pot can't say to the potter, why have you made me like this? Because he's got, he's got ways that are higher than our ways and thoughts that are higher than our thoughts, and he uses everything for his glory. Everything for his glory. Timothy had, had a hierarchy issue. I, I've, I've experienced that in my life as well. Scholars estimate that Timothy was in his late teens to early 20s. And now he's a pastor over probably one of the largest churches in the known world. You think any older individuals on the hierarchy scale might have looked down on Timothy and said, listen here, young whippersnapper. I was doing this when you were still in diapers. You know that hierarchy thing that Jesus said shouldn't be in his church? He says, you know that the Gentiles who have positions of authority lord it over their subjects. But he says, it shall not be among you. As a matter of fact, he says this, that the chiefest among you shall be as the youngest. Wow, the Lord just blessed me the other day. Real quick side note. I was on my, on my quiet time walk and I was, I was listening through Joseph's story again. And, and, and there's Joseph down in the pit. And, and the eldest, eldest son, he goes off and, and, and just kind of relinquishes his, his call as the eldest. And he comes back and Joseph's gone. He's like, what have you guys done? While he's gone, the, the, the next guy kind of steps up right where there's a vacuum. Nature will fill the vacuum. And so Judah steps in and says, hey, let's don't kill him. He is our brother. We can make some money off of this deal. And so they sold him into slavery. Later on in the story, it wasn't Benjamin, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't Reuben the oldest, but here is Judah. He, he comes back and Simeon is, is held captive and, and, and they've got to bring Benjamin back in order to get Simeon back. And Jacob is saying, you need to go back and get some food. We're going to starve to death. And, and Judah says, I ain't going back. That man said, if we don't bring our youngest brother, don't show our face before him again. And so they, they just keep going back until finally Jacob's like, okay, 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 okay. We're going to starve to death. Send him but if he dies, it's just going to be the end of me. And Judah, Judah says, my life for his. I will stand in his place. I will be responsible for him. And I was reminded of the Holy Spirit, that verse that I just quoted you from, G from Jesus. The chiefest among you shall be as the younger if you want to gauge a person's character, watch how they treat the youngest. Watch how they treat the youngest who can't pay them, who can't do anything back for them, who is totally dependent in many cases. 
tell a lot about a person's character. And Jesus says, the chiefest shall be as the younger. So here's Timothy, where we're going to see, Paul says, let no man despise your youth. Don't worry about that, Timothy. Be an example. Show them. Show them. I've spent most of my adult life in ministry having older people look at me and go, what do you know? You don't know nothing. And they're right. I don't know nothing. But I know someone. Right? See, there's a difference in knowing nothing and knowing someone. And I know that someone called me to this something. And I'm going to do what he says to do. And I can't tell you how many times that's been used against me. He proud. He's stubborn. He don't listen to nobody. What you don't hear are the tears in a prayer closet when I'm saying to God, but I am listening to someone. I'm listening to you. And you're telling me to do this. And they're telling me not. Hmm. It got quiet. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. I've got one more thing to look at. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. My intention this morning was to take you from the book of Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and in every single one of those letters, Paul says this, grace be unto you and peace. Look at verse 2. What do you notice? Mm. In all those other letters, writing to the churches, he says grace and peace, grace and peace. In each one of these pastoral epistles, First Timothy being the first, writing to this young pastor, he says, grace, yes, you need grace like every other believer does. Peace, yes, absolutely, you need peace like all the rest do. But you know what else you need? You need mercy, young man. You need mercy. I'm not a rock climber or a mountain climber, but in the safety rules of mountain climbing and rock climbing, one of the safety rules is this, three points of contact at all times. You, you need to be holding, with th three parts of you need to be on the wall so you don't... Grace. Mercy and peace. This word mercy here is equivalent to the Hebrew word hesed in the Old Testament. It's God's loving kindness. It carries the idea of deliverance from judgment. Yes, in the, the spiritual sense, the salvation sense, but even grander than that. Who do you think gets judged the most in any church in this area? Well, of course, that lady with that miniskirt. You think so? It's the pastor. I can't tell you how many times in my prayer closet I said, God, I'm tired of being a runway model. It's true. I walk the catwalk, and I step off. Three, seven, eight point nine, or whatever. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday. Walk the catwalk. What are they going to say this week? Wake up call. Mercy. Do you know that the Bible says mercy rejoices against judgment? Mercy rejoices against judgment. 
This also carries the idea of help. Hebrews chapter 4, we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Right? We, we should come boldly before the throne to find mercy. Mercy. Mercy and grace to help in time of need. I just find it very interesting that when the Lord is addressing the pastors, he adds that third element right in the middle of grace, God's unmerited favor, and peace, mercy. So if you want to know how to pray for your pastor, say, God, be merciful to him. Be merciful to him. Amen? We didn't get super far, but it is what it is. Let's stand.